And now to continue with our symposium this afternoon, Rabindranath Tagore started his creative expression through paint and brush, ink and pen in the evening of his life. He called painting his infatuation. Tagore believed in art, man reveals himself and not his object. In the planning of the symposium, we knew it was critically important to have a segment focusing on the vast collection of painting and drawings as this area of his work is gaining public interest. Tagore's artworks are truly original but have not yet been fully studied and analyzed. And fortunately, we found the perfect person to talk about Tagore's artworks. Raman Shivakumar, professor of art history at Vishwabharati, is totally devoted to the study of Tagore's artworks. He is the curator of the exhibition of Tagore's works that will be in Paris, Berlin, Chicago, New York, and hopefully, if we get donations from everyone here, we'll have it in our city too. I am honored to introduce Dr. Raman Shivakumar. Good evening and um, after the wonderful performance, uh, it's quite difficult to take the stage and um, and talk about something that should not be talked about, perhaps. Should be seen more than talked about. Uh, well, I will do a two-part presentation. Today, I'm going to make the first part, which is of Tago as an artist and the catalyst of modern Indian art. Now, it is going to be the second part of the title that I'm going to focus on more today. Now, as we go ahead, it becomes quite obvious. Part of the background was already talked about by other speakers before me. He was born into this wonderfully talented family many of whom were in the forefront of the cultural resurgence in the 19th century in Bengal and contributed extensively to the growth of the Bengali language, literature, theater, music, and art. Rabindranath entered this world of culture and creativity at a very early age, not through training, but through participation in the activities of his elders. His brother was a talented draftsman. He made excellent portrait sketches of family members, friends, and other cultural luminaries. In fact, there are, I think, about a thousand of them, a lot of them unseen, which would form a part of the cultural history of Bengal because that will be the record that we have of many, many people. His nephews, Gaganendranath and Abhinendranath, were the leaders of a new art movement, which came to be known as the Bengal School. And Rabindranath was drawn to painting very early in his life, as he was drawn to literature, theater, music, and so on. But painting eluded him. Totally. Realizing this after many attempts, he decided to give up painting but turned to the nurture of art in Bengal. To understand how, I mean, and what he tried to do, we'll have to look at probably what the nature of art at that point of time was. And maybe the paintings of Abhinendranath will give us an idea of what painting at that time was. Now, Abhinendranath, who led this new movement, was inspired by the spirit of Sodeshi, at least in his earlier years. 
And so we might consider him as representative of this new art. Although he was trained in Western traditions of painting, under the inspiration of Sudeshi, he wanted to kind of bring back Indian form and content into Indian painting. Now I get, show a couple of um, illustrations of his work. I mean, this one from about 1896, 97, from a series which was called the Krishna Leela series. You can see that he is combining elements of the miniature traditions, but also with, I mean, British watercolor painting, the techniques of British watercolor painting, which he learned. The next one, which was used as a banner during the, the partition of Bengal, which we saw mentioned in the Ray film. This is called Bharat Mada, 1904 or five. And um, this became a kind of iconic painting of the new art at that moment. Or the, the next, which about the same time, the building of Taj, and he was evolving a language of small miniature scale painting, drawing elements from the Mughal and the Japanese traditions. The Japanese tradition comes later, so I'm not going to that. Obviously these three paintings, which represent the beginning of the Bengal school and typical maybe in some sense of the Bengal school, but not typical of Abhinindranath. I'm not going to that, so I'm just mentioning this before it will be very unfair to this artist to stop here and not to talk about his later thing, but I can't do that today because we are going to talk about the impact of Rabindranath. Abhinindranath himself grew into a much more sophisticated, intellectually very complex artist in the 30s. But these are the beginnings of the Bengal school and Rabindranath reacted to these things. Now, he supported the new art movement to the extent that he thought that we should come out of the cultural oblivion into which India was pushed into by colonialism. And, but on the other hand, he also felt that the new art was very historicist and out of contact with the realities of contemporary India. His own experience of rural Bengal, again, other people had commented on this, had held him in transforming his writing and he urged the painters to do something similar. One of the first things he did to encourage them to move in this direction was to invite his nephew, Gaganendranath, to illustrate his reminiscences, an account of his early life. And we have this series of pictures that Gaganendranath did for this, mainly ink on paper. But what was important about this was Gaganendranath was about the same age as Rabindranath. So, and lived in the same house, grew up together. So although these were illustrations to Rabindranath's memoirs. It was also in a sense about his own childhood experiences. The teacher at the gate during the rains, I mean, you can see the impact of the Japanese even here, or the tree in the courtyard which Rabindranath, then Rabindranath used to watch through the windows. Now you can see this was definitely a change from the earlier work we saw. This was around 1909 that he invites him to do these illustrations. From what we saw of the Bengal school around 1904, five, this definitely is a big change. But, I mean, this shift of trajectory was a short one. Gaganendranath moved away gradually, but it didn't happen immediately. And 
it didn't make a big impact on the Bengal school. There was no rethinking as it. Now the next thing that happens in a significant date is 1916 when Rabindranath visits Japan. And there in the art of Japan and the design traditions of Japan, he finds something that came close to what he wanted the Indian artist to. An art that was monumental in scale, responsive to nature, and added beauty to every aspect of life. He, this was the kind of painting he liked. It's a painting by Shimamura Kansan, and he actually got it copied by a contemporary painter, Rai Kambo, and he brought it back with him to uh, Shantiniketan. And from 1916 onwards, gradually a whole collection of Far Eastern art grew up in Shantiniketan. Of course, Far Eastern art was known to the Bengal school artist even before Rabindranath went there. But what was important was that he was trying to, not just to imbibe elements of Far Eastern art in the personal style of the artist, but to imbibe the, the overall aesthetics of Japanese art and how it touched upon other aspects of life, every aspect of life, in fact. So he found that the Bengal school probably was not willing to address all the issues that he wanted artists to address. So he decides to start the school. He had identified Nandalal as probably the appropriate person to do this, and he invited him actually in 1914. And from 1914 onwards, he kept coming every weekend. But in 1919, he begins this whole new art school there. Now, the idea was not just to teach art, but to make the art school the nucleus of a new art movement, and also of a building of a new kind of culture. Before me, Shermila was talking about some of these other aspects, but the, I am going to focus on the changes that these people, Nandalal and the students, Binod Bihari and especially Ram Kinga, brought into the art scene. And they really brought in a shift from the historic trajectory of the Bengal school and developed a sense of identity based on a sense of place. This led to a new kind of modern art in India based on personal experiences of the artist of the land and life around them. Of course, this is Nandalal before he came to Shandiniketan. While he was still in Calcutta and following his teacher, Abhinantanand. But gradually you can see things happen. The impact of the Japanese art. He is now doing something that is, I mean, in a, done in a different vocabulary altogether. And, I mean, you can see it has a decorative language, decorative in the sense not of being ornamental, but in the sense that a lot of modern art, like Paul Clay or Mathis would be decorative. A decorative language with a touch of the real. A great sense of design and beauty based on design rather than the beauty that we normally see in objects represented. Again, you have been shown images, other images from the series, the Haripura posters of 1936, done at the behest of Gandhi. Nandalal was as close to Gandhi as he was to Rabindranath. And once again, you see this economy of language. You were shown these folk objects that he copied, but you can see how he derived the language, took it to an entirely different plane. 
nature and rural life painted with great economy and decorative worm. You also have a mural like this where, I mean, based on the stories of the Mahabharat or events of the Mahabharat, where the assimilation of the Japanese decorative tradition and monumentality that Rabindranath wanted are brought together. This is in Baroda, this mural. But the most interesting things are these paintings where you bring in a feeling of the, the place, the local, very strongly. And thousands and thousands of these drawings that he did, where the sense of location and empathy with nature is expressed most brilliantly. I don't think so. There is another artist in India who responded to nature as much as Nandalal did. And we can probably, it's a, I mean, a whole exhibition just on his drawings. You can here, for instance, feel it's late summer in Shantiniketan. The leaves are almost dried up. I mean, you can feel that whole heat, the dr dryness and everything through the whole landscape. And this little, I mean, animal poised there, almost stopped on its track at that corner there. Now, these are these wonderful things that he did, and you can see this is very far away from the, the Bengal school. The other artist, Vinod uh, Bihari, a student, um, he was as, it's a self-portrait, a painter who was both craftsman and a Taoist recluse. The way he kind of handles those details, I mean, if one could look at them from near, see this minuteness, almost like a craftsman's interest in everything, including his own tools, the way he painted them. But also somebody who is, I mean, almost by himself, and, uh, but always too, very close to nature. He looks at nature with a slightly different lens than Nandala, especially his early works, more brooding, somber quality. But gradually, and in fact, all the artists in Shantiniketan, all the major ones, they looked at the same landscape, but saw it slightly differently. But gradually, he also opened himself to the the joyful aspects of nature. And he used the Far Eastern scrolls, the horizontal scroll format, to paint the flat, I mean, unending stretch of land. You had images of that, I mean, photographs by the earlier uh, speakers, and as well as in the film by Ray, where we saw this landscape. And there is an excellent, I mean, a scroll of that kind of landscape as well, but I chose to show this one, which has more of the greenery. It's a, a different segment of that same scroll. It's a large one. I'm just taking two bits of that. Or almost an encyclopedic vision of the same landscape on the ceiling of a hostel building. Now, I'm using a, some of the early photographs taken just after this was painted to show you the kind of details. The, each tree is differently treated. And into this, I mean, there are buffaloes, geezers, people of various kinds of things moving through the landscape monkeys on the trees, um, all kinds of leaders, very, very fabulously done. He probably adopted certain elements, the format, the language of brushwork, etc., from the Far Eastern artist, but uses all that to create 
a kind of comprehensive image of the land and the people, the way nature and life amalgamated in the villages around. Again, another little fragment of that. And this great mural he did in 1946-47, just as we were on the verge of independence, but the communal strifes were also beginning. And a mural that looked at the, the story of India or this culture or civilization in a large panoramic vision. This is the central wall. It covers three walls. And it looks, it takes a synoptic view of Indian culture, moving from one figure to the other, and captured like a procession of life. Probably it will be of some significance to know that Binod Bihari was almost blind. He probably could see only from about a feet away from the wall. So doing something over eight feet in height and more than 80 feet in width and without a cartoon or a preliminary drawing spontaneously onto the wall in an Italian wet process, I mean, fresco. I mean, this man should have carried it all in his head and a monumental mural like this to be carried in your head and reproduced spontaneously on the wall because you can't repaint a fresco. You have to simply scrape it off if something goes wrong. I mean, these were great artists that came there, created a whole new art scene in India. Probably this is the, arguably the single most important work done by a modern painter in India. The other artist was Ram Kinkar. Now you can see it moves away from everything that Bengal school represented, the historicism and all on. And comes onto the life of the people around. And Ramkinga especially reacted to the peasants and the tribals around him. The sculpture which is already shown to you. I mean, valorizing and giving a monumental presence to local life. Now, this is the first art that does so in India, modern Indian art that valorizes local life and local people to this. There is also this very intimate poetry in his art. And like everyone else, he responds to this beautiful nature around him. Now, definitely, art at Shantaniketan had moved away from the myth and literature inspired historicist art of the Bengal school. Rabindranath's ideas and Nandalal's, I mean, creative innovations were pivotal to bring in bringing about this change. The new art was informed both by the artist's sense of geographical location in rural Bengal and their historical location in the modern. I mean, it is something that Rabindranath wanted them to take note of. Both their geographical location in rural Bengal and their historical location in the modern. One could call this, as I had called in an early exhibition I curated on the art, a contextual modernism or a cosmopolitan local. Now in Rabindranath's own um, case, while the arts of Asia played a big role in shaping the formal aspects of 
art in Shantiniketan, he believed that cultural contacts rather than cultural insularity was important to the growth and nurture of creativity. And this was something he thought the modern period offered us. And he used his travels abroad to look at new art everywhere he went. And it began to change his own aesthetic preferences. In 18, I mean, 90s, we see he's talking enthusiastically of academic realist artist. Around 1900, he's supporting the new art movement, I mean, of the nationalist. But gradually, you see that he begins to appreciate the expressive transformations of form in modern Western art and primitive art. I mean, while he didn't talk about that in his letters or writings, he was quietly going to the museums from very early on. Even during his first visit, he went to the Exposition Universal in Paris on his way to London, had a view of that, the British Museum. Subsequently, he was looking at modernist painting, and when he was in America, probably he went to the Armory Show. So he was constantly engaging with what was happening modern, and similarly, through books on anthropology and so on, he was looking at primitive art, and he owned quite a few of these. He also re realized, by looking at this, that different skills and different ways of seeing led to different kinds of image making. And that all art did not start from the seen image and move towards representation. And some, in fact, moved in the opposite direction from materials and tools towards image, as a lot of primitive art and modern art did. This understanding led him to discover that he too had certain skills and enough control over linear expression to make him an artist. Though he had given up attempts to paint, he was all the while doodling away in his notebooks without thinking if they had any artistic value. But in the early 20s, he was beginning to encounter art nouveau and primitive art in a big way, largely through books as well as through his travels. Art Nouveau already had a kind of interest because of his connection with Japan. And he realized around 1924 that with a little tooling, the erasers that he did, the doodles that he did in his notebooks could be turned into expressive forms. This is a very early doodle, around 1904. So you can see he was already doing this in his notebooks. But in 23 or 24, you can see they have taken a slightly different shape. They are more expressive, more consciously worked, or pages from the same book in 1924. Or these, where the writing has completely disappeared and turned the image into an image. So it was not only the erasers becoming decorative objects, but eventually the erasers completely wiping out the writing and leading to images. While he did this in his notebooks in 1924, Victoria Campo, when she saw some of these, she noticed the expressive power, and this in turn made Rabindranath conscious of the artistic merit of his own doodles. And four years later, he began to paint independent paintings. And in 1930, he had his first exhibition in Paris, again held by Ocampo in organizing it. Now, his earliest works were of imaginary animals, masks, and landscapes, and things like that. They were products of imagination as well as playful use of materials and tools. Although they did not, I mean, represent real things or animals, they carried the animation of real things or animals. 
as he himself said, things that probably missed the chance of existence. Sometimes you can see that he was looking at primitive art, like objects in this museum. And obviously one of the things he looked at was Peruvian art, probably also African art. Then inventing things along that line of his own, or as a traveler, maybe seabirds that he saw somewhere. He did not seek his images, he found them. But once they arrived and took some rudimentary form, then he tried to consciously transform them. Gradually, his visual experience of the world around began to add nuances to his imagination. But he always refused to name his images. But we always notice a sense of presence when you are in front of them. Be it a figure or a landscape, viewing his works becomes a silent and poignant meeting with the world. I'm sure it was like that for him as an artist. I'll run through a few images today very quickly. Tomorrow probably we'll talk about them a little more in detail, but the various phases, the images of people that he saw around, you can see there's a wide variety of these and a wide variety of emotions and expressions, some of them leading to a theatrical kind of imagery, or this wonderful group portrait in, I mean, in landscape, or just images of nature. I mean, we were told about this habit of, I mean, getting up at four o'clock in the Ray documentary. And we have descriptions of these in his reminiscences. And the twilight was something that he was drawn to. Of course, in his early days, it was the twilight of dawn, but in the paintings, it is largely the twilight of dusk. But fairly poignant silent views. And he wanted us to respond to his paintings as we respond to nature, without preconceptions, without, I mean, a whole text before us, but with our sensibilities. And uh, I stop here, and appropriately, I suppose the next presentation is called Song of Nature. Thank you. Thank you.